Thank you for joining our webinar, Findings from the UK Bipolar Disorder Research Network. I'm excited to introduce our panelist, Dr. Catherine Gordon-Smith. Dr. Catherine Gordon-Smith is a senior research fellow in psychological medicine at the University of Worcester. She was one of the co-founders of the Bipolar Disorder Research Network, BDRN, a group of researchers, clinicians, and research participants in the UK involved in investigating the underlying causes of bipolar disorder. So far, BDRN has more than 7,000 research participants. Catherine's particular research interest is comorbidities in bipolar disorder, including migraine and anxiety. She oversees the running of the mood monitoring system True Colors, which is currently being offered to BDRN members in collaboration with colleagues at the University of Oxford. The system is delivering a vast amount of data to help understand more about how mood symptoms present over time in individuals with bipolar disorder and how they are affected by changes in routines such as sleep. Catherine works closely with BDRN research champions, research participants with lived experience of bipolar disorder, who provide expert advice and input into the BDRN research program and True Colors. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Gordon-Smith. So I'm really pleased to give you this short presentation about some of our findings from the UK Bipolar Disorder Research Network, BGRN. I'm Catherine Gordon-Smith and I'm a member of BGRN and a research fellow at the University of Worcester. Okay, so I'm just going to have my camera turned off during this presentation so you can see my slides fully. So just for a bit of background, BDRN is a large network of individuals with bipolar disorder and related mood disorders in the UK. Uh, it's led by two research groups, one at the University of Worcester and one at Cardiff University. And we've had over 7,000 members to date helping with our ongoing research. So the overall aim of BGRN is to learn more about the causes of bipolar disorder and to achieve this we investigate how genetic and environmental factors such as stressful life events interact and influence susceptibility to bipolar disorder. We're also members of the Bipolar Disorder Working Group of the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. So this is a large ongoing international collaboration exploring genetic variations in over 40,000 individuals with bipolar disorder. And the findings to date are contributing significantly to our understanding of the biological basis of bipolar disorder. A particular research interest of BGRN are the factors associated with variations in the presentation of bipolar disorder and how these associations can help us learn more about the causes of bipolar disorder. So these are just some of the examples that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so comorbid conditions such as migraine, alcohol use and childhood events. So this is a paper that we published a few years ago now looking at the relationship between migraine and bipolar disorder. So previous research has shown that migraine is more common among those with individuals with bipolar disorder but less was known about whether among individuals with bipolar disorder if having migraine is associated with any specific features um, and this is what we looked at. So we had a large group of individuals with bipolar disorder with and without migraine. And the key findings are shown on this graph here. So you can see that those with migraine, which are the dark blue column, um, were more likely to have a rapid cycling illness course, panic attacks, and also have a family history of mood disorder compared to those individuals with bipolar disorder without migraine. So it's not shown on this graph, but individuals with migraine were also more likely to be female and ha have an earlier age of onset of bipolar disorder. When we controlled for the factors, um, what we found was it was actually rapid cycling and panic attacks that remained the significant association um, and significantly associated with having migraine. And what our findings really suggest is that identifying individuals who have both bipolar disorder and migraine in a clinical setting might be particularly helpful. Okay, so this is a very recent paper that we had published looking at patterns of alcohol use among men and women in the UK with bipolar disorder. 
So prior to this study, um, the vast majority of previous research had looked at rates of alcohol abuse and dependence in bipolar disorder, but not actual alcohol use more widely. So we looked at lifetime heaviest alcohol use in a large sample um, of over 1,000 women and 600 men with bipolar disorder. And the graphs that you can see here show the pattern of heaviest alcohol use, which is measured in UK units, in uh, women and men separately. And what we found was that at their heaviest alcohol use, 52% of women and 74% of men were with bipolar disorder in our sample had regularly consumed over the du double the UK recommended guidelines, which is currently 14 units. We also found that increasing levels of alcohol consumption in both men and women was associated with individuals reporting or having a, fa a, a history of suicide attempts and rapid cycling illness course. Additionally, among women, um, we found that increased alcohol use was associated with more, de more episodes of depression and mania in the past, and also with comorbid conditions such as panic disorder and eating disorder. So again, our findings really highlight the importance of monitoring alcohol consumption in bipolar disorder, and also that this may be helpful in predicting illness course among some individuals. So a final paper that I'm going to talk about is a study that we did looking at the relationship between childhood trauma and mood instability among individuals with bipolar 1 and 2 disorder and major depression. So mood instability, which is sometimes called mood lability, are rapid changes in mood that some individuals experience outside of major mood episodes. So we measured this in our sample using the effective lability scale. Um, and these are just some examples of the items on the scale. Um, for example, many times I feel nervous and tense and then suddenly um, I feel very sad and down. Um, and what we found was among individuals with bipolar 1 disorder, those who reported experiencing abuse in their childhood were significantly more likely to have higher levels of affective um, instability in adulthood. Um, so this suggests that these individuals may particularly benefit from specific, specific clinical interventions. So finally, I'm going to talk briefly about our latest initiative, which is something called True Colours. So this is a, an online mood monitoring system designed by the University of Oxford, which is helping us learn more about how mood symptoms change over time for individuals with bipolar disorder. So over a thousand BGRM participants have joined True Colours and basically how it works is that individuals receive a weekly email with a link that takes them to two short questionnaires um, where they answer questions about how their mood has been um, over the last week. So over time these responses are plotted as a graph that individuals can log in and view at any time. They can also um, print off their graphs if they wish and show them that to their clinician. So what we've done is we've produced a short guide for, for clinicians just explaining how to interpret the graphs. And this is just an example of how um, an individual's graph might look over a three month, one year and three year period. So the red graphs are plotting mania scores and the blue graphs are plotting depression scores. Um, people can choose how they view their graphs so they can see them separately like it's presented here or can look at have them on the same graph. So participants have reported a number of benefits of using True Colours. For example, people have reported that they find it helpful to keep a track of their mood, um, helping to spot particular triggers. Other individuals have reported that they find that True Colours helps them communicate their mood to others, such as their friends and their, their family. Um, very early on, we started to receive feedback from individuals that the mood questionnaires that we're asking individuals to complete alone were not fully capturing their experiences um, of living with bipolar disorder. So in response to this, what we did was we introduced the option for individuals to monitor self-selected aspects of bipolar disorder um, that they perceived as important. So individuals can choose from a list of suggested questions or they have the option to make up their own. 
So these are some examples of suggested questions that participants can choose from. Um, for example, in the last week, how many minutes of exercise have I done each day on average? So responses to these questions are then plotted as graphs um, in, under, in, under individuals' mood graphs. Um, and these can be helpful for individuals to look for particular patterns in their mood. As I said, individuals also have the option to design their own questions, um, and these are just some examples here. What, what I've done is change the wording slightly to, to protect individuals' privacy. Um, so just to read out a couple of examples, these include this week, have I been answering texts? Or how many times have I seen a friend this week? Um, and what we've done in some very recent analysis is look at the content of these questions individuals have selected in true colours and look to see if we can see any themes. Um, and we think the, the findings are quite, are quite interesting. Okay, so this is a very um, colourful picture diagram here. Um, so what we found is when we analysed the questions that individuals were choosing to ask themselves on true colours, that they fell into 35 categories which are represented on this diagram here by the boxes. Um, the most common categories for individuals to ask themselves about were exercise and physical activity, anxiety and stress and coping. Um, and then what we did was we grouped these categories, these 35 categories, into six broader overarching themes um, of what individuals were choosing to monitor in relation to their bipolar disorder. And these are represented on this figure by the, the bigger circles. So if we start at the top left corner and work wise, work clockwise rounds, um, these themes related to, first of all, individuals monitoring their behaviour and level of functioning. Um, for example, an individual asking themselves how many days last week did I leave the house? Um, the next theme related to individuals monitoring their social contacts and social interactions with others. The theme in blue there um, related to individuals monitoring various aspects of their mental health that were not covered in their weekly mood questionnaires, for example, anxiety. Individuals also chose to monitor aspects of their physical health and health behaviours, such as exercise and eating patterns. And finally, the last theme related to individuals monitoring the management of their mood disorder. For example, contact with clinicians, coping strategies and changes in medication. So we do think these findings are really interesting as they show that there's many aspects of bipolar disorder that are important for individuals to monitor that extend well beyond the classic mood symptoms that are usually part of mood monitoring. So finally, throughout the COVID pandemic, um, we've had over 200 BDRM participants on True Colours have been completing additional weekly questionnaires specifically concerned with their experiences in relation to COVID-19. Um, of course, everyone's experiences are very different, but our initial data has shown that it's feelings of anxiety and impact on usual coping strategies that have been a particular concern for individuals in our sample. Finally, this is just to say a massive thank you to all of those individuals who continue to help us with our ongoing research. We're so grateful um, to everybody who's helped us over the years. Um, we'd also like to thank uh, the National Institute for Health Research and clinicians throughout the UK who support our research and also the UK charity Bipolar UK. And these pictures here are just of my BJN colleagues at the University of Worcester and Cardiff University that I've had the pleasure of working with for many years now. Okay, so thank you for listening. Um, for more information, please go to our website, bjn.org. Thank you.